Morning, everyone. The first reading comes from Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and the great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to be, become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be the first among you must be, must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So you're going to have to look at me and not at the screen because of the delay thing going on. Um, actually, you don't have to look at me at all if you'd rather not. <laughs> That's okay too. But the first thing I want to do this morning is have a look at this text. Let's just go through the text. I just want to highlight some of the things from this Bible passage that uh, might jump out to you or might be of interest before we kind of look at how we might apply it to our lives this week. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. In other words, they were sort of coming to him and asking for a blank check. Has that ever happened to you? Has anybody ever given you a blank check? It happened to me once. We were doing a fundraiser for World Vision, and the gentleman, I don't know who he was, walked up to me, and uh, we had a target amount, he just gave me a check. And uh, I said, well, thank you very much, that's really kind of you. And he walked to, as he walked to it, I down, and went, oh, he hasn't put the, the amount in. And I, just, and I rushed after him, I tapped him on the shoulder, and I said, excuse me, excuse me, you haven't put the amount. And he hadn't put an amount on the check. He said, no, 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 you fill that in. You fill that in. How much do you want? I went, well. And I told him a number, and he went, fill that in. I went, okay, thank you. Being handed a blank check. And that's what these guys were doing, if you like, to Jesus. Do whatever we ask. And actually, we know that it was Salome, if you read in Matthew's Gospel, uh, the, the mother of, of, of uh, James and John, who had kind of pushed them to do this. And you might think, oh, that's a really rude thing to do. Why go to, uh, to Jesus and, and, and ask this question? Because what they ask is this. Jesus, being typically Jesus, didn't just kind of go, excuse me, do whatever you ask, hello. You know, he says, no, let, come on in, let's have it out. Let's reveal the state of your heart. And they say, he says, what do you want them to do? What do you want me to do for you? And they say, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, you might think that was a really weird request. But bearing in mind that at this point, Jesus had said to them, the 12 of you are going to sit on the, on the thrones. 12 thrones will be the, ru- rule, the rulers of Israel. They're going to be ruling with me on these 12 thrones prepared for you. So in a way, they were sort of kind of, yeah, going for the promise. And don't think that they, you know, I know that we kind of use this as a, t- uh, as a song and text to say, these guys were in the wrong and we should kind of oh, berate them and aren't they terrible for asking Jesus this and uh, aren't they kind of proud and showy offy and all the rest of it. But actually, they were actually hoping and trusting that Jesus was one day going to rule and he was going to come into his kingdom fully and be you know, enthroned as the king. And, you know, they were, they were holding on to that promise. Yeah, it might have been a bit of a cheeky thing to ask, but <laughs> they were holding on to the promise of Jesus. And the irony, of course is that when we talk about Jesus' glory, when you come into your glory, we know what the glory of Jesus was. The glory of Jesus was when he hung on the cross. And to be enthroned to the left and the right of Jesus, we know who were enthroned to the left and right of Jesus, don't we? 
Calvary. They didn't know what they were asking. So Jesus comes right back at them and says, well, can you drink the cup that I've got to drink from? Can you have the baptism that I'm baptized with? And if you ever wonder what that means, the cup was the cup of God's wrath. All the way through the Old Testament prophets, you had the cup, the cup representing this cup of God's wrath, this cup of, of pain and suffering. It's a metaphor. It's not a literal cup, it's a metaphor. And the baptism he's talking about is a metaphor again. It's a metaphor all the way through the Old Testament prophets, the idea of a deluge, of pain and suffering, the waters rising. This is what Jesus is referring to. Can you go through the pain and suffering that I'm going to go through? The cup I've got to drink from, the baptism I've got to be baptised with. Can you do that? And they say, yes, we can. And he says, yeah, you can do that. You are going to do that. It's a bit of, a, it's a bit of an encouragement, actually. Yes, you are going to do that. You are going to drink from my cup. You are going to share in my baptism. And actually, we know that James was executed something like three years later. John was put into exile. Horrendous, horrendous, horrendous things happened to the disciples. They went through the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. But he says, but it's not for me. It's not for me to say who's going to be at my left and my right hand. Now, when the ten heard this, they became angry with James and John, didn't they? And then we've got this little passage that describes a bit about how the kingdom of God is different to the kingdom of human beings. We have this passage that says, You know that among the Gentiles, those who they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. Yeah, that's the pattern of the world. It's the pattern of the world then, it's the pattern of the world today. But not so among you. No, the kingdom of God is going to be different, Jesus said. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be his servant. And servant there actually means, the word literally means someone, one who serves tables. That's, yeah, it's going to be the servant of all. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave to all. And this very famous line, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. I'm just going to turn the camera off because it's... Doing my funny thing. How the kingdom is different. How the kingdom of God is different to the kingdom of human beings. I guess the faith lesson that I want us to take away today is that the gospel should always be like a mirror to us in which we try and see our reflection. Can you see yourself reflected in this? The kingdom of God is a different kingdom. It's based on a different set of rules. And at the heart of the gospel is this, is this, if you like, the engine of the gospel is this very fact that Jesus was atoning for our sins. Yeah? Our freedom, our freedom from the bondage and slavery of sin and death was going to come at the expense of God. There was a cost to pay. I wrote here, it means that the cost of our salvation was the cross of Christ. We're redeemed from the bondage of sin and death. And I love this. I've not heard this before. But there was a, a, a quite a poor American, and they said this. They said, can you explain the gospel to me? And he said, I can explain it to you in one sentence. Either I die, or he die. He die, me no die. <laughs> I love that. You know what everyone remembers? Yeah, I don't know, it's one of these ones that was, it's really simple, but I quite find it hard to remember. Yeah? Either I die or he die. He die, me no die. There you go, that's the gospel in one line. That is the, the, what we proclaim, is that we are set free from the, the bondage of sin and death by our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to suffer. Mm -hmm. That's the engine, if you like, that, that underpins the kingdom that we are now part of. When Jesus redeemed us as a ransom for many, when he redeemed us, he... Uh, we became his. Yeah, he paid for us, so we now belong to him. Does that make sense? And we're now his servants. We now belong into his kingdom. And this kingdom is a totally different kind of kingdom. Now, Jesus, when, uh, when I'm saying this, I just want to read to you from Isaiah 53. Because if you've, you've probably read it before, you may know it. But if you, it kind of sums up, doesn't it? It just sums up the heart of the gospel. Listen to this. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering 
and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his, his anguish shall, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death. Boom! There it is. That's, oh, that's the gospel, isn't it? That's what Jesus is saying. That's the heart of our gospel. So therefore, if we are redeemed by Christ, if we are belonging to this other kind of kingdom, what does it look like? The church has a different kind of organisational structure, has a different kind of hierarchy. You might think, oh yes, there's deacons and priests and bishops and stuff, there's a hierarchy. No. No, no, not at all. It's the opposite. Deacons are here. There's no hierarchy in the church. There is no one higher than anyone else. And in fact, the deacons, the priests, and the bishops are lower than everybody else. That's the truth of it. Deacon means servant. Every priest is ordained a deacon first. You are called to first be a servant. Then you're called to be a priest, which is just an elder, someone to help lead others. And then if you're called to be a bishop, that just means you're an overseer. But every bishop is also a deacon and a priest. Do you know that in the church, in the Anglican church? Bishop Nick is a deacon. He's a priest and he's a bishop. He happens to be a servant, an elder and an overseer. I am a servant and an elder. That's what these words mean. They've come to mean something else. When you think of the word priest, you think maybe something different, don't you, in your head. It just means elder. When you think of the word deacon, it just means servant. When you think bishop, you don't think pointy hats and you know, the rest of it. You just think somebody overseas. That's why we wear dog collars. You know why we wear dog collars? You ever wonder why we wear dog collars? Not because we want to say woof. <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. Save time. Do, you know why, do you know why we wear dog collars? Save time. To save time? <laughs> so I know. So <laughs> nobody know why we wear dog collars, really? Do you not know why, why, why vicars wear dog collars? Come on, you've all been Anglicans way longer than I have. Oh, we wear dog collars because we're wearing our clothes back to front. That's the truth. That's why clerical shirts don't have oh, my, don't have buttons down the front. They hide the buttons to make it look like you're wearing your shirt back to front. In fact, the first clerical shirts were just, you'd wear your shirt back to front to show that you were going in a different direction, that you belonged to a different kingdom. And then... So that's why you see, like, Jay would wear the one with a really wide collar, because that's what he's saying. He's showing you the back. He's trying to show you the back of his shirt. And, of course, they did, to be a bit more practical, they, they then made the shirts button up front, but then hid the buttons, so it looks like you've got a shirt on backwards. And then that developed into, into this. But it's a sign of saying, actually, I'm wearing my clothes back to front. I'm going a different way. I'm not going up. I'm going down. Does that make sense? Now you can tell all your friends at parties now, so you put that, one, yeah, that little nugget of wisdom there. Our church should be uh, recognised by our humility. It's a different kingdom. And humility is the act of putting God and others before ourselves all the time, every time. 
You see, the world prizes these things. I'm talking for a long time today, I'm really sorry. The um, world prizes these things. Wealth, beauty, intelligence, power, achievement, status, and reputation. I just wanted to just, I haven't even done this, I just thought I'd do this uh, live. But what are the opposites of those things? Could we treasure those? Let's, let's go through them. What's the opposite of wealth? Poverty. Do we prize those that are poor? Do we look out for the poor? Do we hold them in high esteem? Do we do all we can to bless them and encourage them and support them? What about beauty? What's the opposite of beauty? Beauty. Ugliness. Ugliness. Brokenness, maybe. Those that are twisted and hurt and damaged by events and circumstances in this world. Do we love that? Do we, do we hold them up? Do we prize them? What about intelligence? What's the opposite of intelligence? <laughs> Ignorance, yeah. The foolish. Do we make it so that our worship, our prayers, our, our way of being, our, our ways of communicating are able to be accessible by all children, those with learning difficulties, those, yeah? Do we hold them in high regard? Do we put them first? What about power? What's the opposite of power? Weakness. Do we seek to have power? Or do we seek, do we prize those that actually serve? When I was training as a training cure, my, my, my vicar said, you'd be the first person to put the chairs out and the last person to put the chairs away at the end, Gav, in your ministry. I've always remembered that. And um, apart from today. <laughs> We're all going to go to Holy Trinity Church, you can do that. Uh, <laughs> achievement. I suppose it's underachievement. Is that the opposite of achievement? We do, we do. Don't we highly rate achievement? Failure. 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 Yeah. Do we carry those that fail? Do we hold them? Hands up if you're a failure here. Okay, you don't have to do it. But yeah, me too. Status. I suppose that's high status. So status can be a, a, a variable word, can't it? But low status. Low social class. Low social, yeah. Do we hold everybody, no matter who they are, what background they're from, no matter what their upbringing, no matter what colour, gender, age, do we, do we prize them? Reputation. Reputation. Something that was new to me in Bermuda that just floored me a little bit. I'm not criticising this, but it was a bit strange to go to a funeral and then whoever's leading would then point out all the dignitaries who, you know, who are, who are attending a funeral. And I was just like, whoa, that's totally new to me. I've never done that before, not ever. And they would, yeah, I'd go to a funeral and they'd say, and of course we welcome the Honourable MP, blah, 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 and, and oh, so great to have the, the leader of this, you know, with us. And, you know, um, oh, okay. But it's cool to model a different kind of church. Do you know what? Oh, sorry, I'm just rambling today. But I'm... So, when I first I went to this church and, um, in, in Bristol, and it makes me cry just thinking about this, because it was just the most amazing congregation. It was the messiest church I've ever been to. And they had a ministry to actually, uh, the, the, the gay community had a ministry to uh, women coming out of the sex industry. They had, uh, and children were so important that actually quite often the, ch- the adults would leave and the children would stay in the church for their group, yeah? And I remember... Uh, when I first went to this church, that there was my daughter playing with a guy, uh, dancing to the worship music, and and then the the pastor sat down at the front, sat my little Gemma on his lap with the, some bongos while they were playing, and it was just and the message was these people are welcome, they are important, they are valued. Children are so important in this church, and she loved it, and she was just like, this is amazing. This is the first church I've ever been to where not only you didn't have to sit in a pew and stay quiet, you could run around and then come to the front, and you'll be wrapped in arms and called to join in, dance, play the music. It was just, it was wonderful, wonderful. Hold a mirror to this gospel passage today. Hold a mirror to it. The engine, Jesus, has ransomed you. So therefore, what kind of church, what kind of organisation do we want to be? What kind of people do we want to be? as we proclaim the gospel and be witnesses to God's love in the world. I wrote, so this is lyrics to a, to a song I wrote ages ago. I never recorded the song. The, the lyrics weren't that great, but they popped into my mind. 
today, and maybe God will say to share. It's very simple, and it's a prayer, actually. It's a song that's a prayer. It's very short. The lyrics go like this. Help us be pure and holy. Help us live lives that honour you. Please send your Holy Spirit to guide us in everything we do. We love you, God, with all our hearts. We love our neighbours as ourselves, giving you praise with all our hearts, ringing the Jesus freedom bell. I love that. Ringing the Jesus freedom bell. That just, we are people saying, yes, we're redeemed, we're saved, we're restored. Come and join us, no matter who you are. That was a very long talk. Amen. Amen.